Hello and welcome. I'm Fernando, a GP in the UK. Today, we will go through the NICE guideline on menorrhagia, or to be precise, heavy menstrual bleeding assessment and management, summarizing the guidance from a primary care perspective. Make sure you stay until the end, because I will also be presenting the guideline in the form of a mind map or flowchart, which will make it easier to understand and remember, and that you will be able to download if you're interested. So let's jump into it. We will obviously take a history including the nature and impact of the bleeding and we will particularly pay attention to what NICE refers to as related symptoms. These are symptoms such as persistent intermenstrual bleeding, pelvic pain and or pressure symptoms because they may suggest a uterine abnormality. What may come as a surprise is that NICE says that if none of these symptoms are present that is, no intermenstrual bleeding, no pain and no pressure symptoms, we will consider pharmacological treatments without necessarily carrying out a physical examination. But obviously we will do that if we have any clinical concerns. But the converse is true. A physical examination is recommended if such symptoms exist or if we are considering levonorgestrel releasing intrauterine system, that is, a marina coil or similar. In terms of blood tests, we will perform a full blood count for all patients and we will consider testing for coagulation disorders if they have had heavy periods since they started and there is a personal or family history suggestive of it. However, NICE says that there is no need for routine ferritin, hormone or thyroid testing. We will then consider investigations for the cause of the heavy menstrual bleeding but we will also consider starting pharmacological treatment without investigating the cause if we feel that there is a low risk of uterine abnormality. If we do investigate further, we will consider the need for hysteroscopy, a pelvic ultrasound scan or a transvaginal ultrasound scan. And we will choose each investigation depending on whether we suspect some mucosal fibroids, polyps or endometrial pathology, in which case a hysteroscopy would be needed, larger fibroids, in which case a pelvic ultrasound would be needed, or adenomyosis, when a transvaginal ultrasound would be recommended. And we will use our clinical judgment to decide which one of these we will consider as most likely. For example, if we suspect submucosal fibroids, polyps or endometrial pathology, and therefore the need to refer for possible hysteroscopy plus minus biopsy, if, for example, they take it to they have persistent intermenstrual or irregular bleeding, they have infrequent heavy bleeding and are obese or have polycystic ovarian syndrome, or if they have not responded to treatment. We will think about larger fibroids and therefore the need to request a pelvic ultrasound scan if there is a palpable uterus on abdominal examination, a pelvic mass is suspected, and we will also consider a pelvic ultrasound scan if the examination is inconclusive or difficult, because, for example, obesity. And we will think about adenomyosis and therefore the need for a transvaginal ultrasound scan if there's a bulky, tender uterus on examination or there is significant dysmenorrhea or period pain. But we will also need to be aware that the pain may be caused by endometriosis rather than adenomyosis. If hysteroscopy is declined, we will consider a pelvic ultrasound explaining its limitation. If a transvaginal ultrasound is declined or unsuitable, we will consider a transabdominal ultrasound or MRI, also explaining their limitations. Let's now look at the management of menorrhagia. As we have previously said, we will refer for hysteroscopy those patients in whom we suspect an endometrial pathology. So we will leave their management in the hands of secondary care. So, from a primary care perspective and for the purpose of their management, we need to group the remaining patients into two types. Patients with no identified pathology, with fibroids less than 3 cm in diameter or with adenomyosis, and patients with fibroid of 3 cm or more. For the first group, that is patients with no identified pathology, with small fibroids or adenomyosis, we will consider a levonorgestrel intrauterine system first line as long as, if there are small fibroids, they do not cause distortion of the uterine cavity. On offering this treatment, we will explain to them about the anticipated changes in bleeding pattern, particularly in the first few cycles and maybe lasting longer than six months. 
and that it is advisable to wait for at least six cycles to see the benefits of the treatment. If levonorgestrel in treatment system is declined or unsuitable, we will consider pharmacological treatments, either non-hormonal, like tranexamic acid and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or hormonal, like combined hormonal contraception and cyclical oral progestogens. Also bearing in mind that progesterone-only contraception may suppress menstruation, which could be beneficial for some patients too. If the symptoms are severe or do not respond to pharmacological treatment, or the patient declines pharmacological treatment, we will refer. For the second group, that is patients with fibroids of 3 cm or more in diameter, we will consider referral, and if pharmacological treatment is needed while waiting for investigations, we will consider tranexamic acid and or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. But we need to be aware that the effectiveness of pharmacological treatments may be limited if fibroids are substantially greater than 3 cm in diameter. Depending on the size, location and number of fibroids and the severity of the symptoms, a number of other treatments may be considered by secondary care, including further pharmacological or surgical treatment. Right, so this is the end of the guideline as such. So let's have a look at the mind map or flowchart. And we start with the history of menorrhagia or heavy menstrual bleeding. First of all, we will consider some blood tests, which will include a full blood count for everyone. We may consider coagulation testing if we have clinical suspicions or there are risk factors. But we will not routinely request ferritin, hormonal tests or thyroid function tests. In the history, we will pay attention as to whether there is intermenstrual bleeding, pain or feeling of pressure. If these symptoms are not present, then we will consider treatment without doing an examination, although we will consider the examination if we have any clinical concerns. However, if there is intermenstrual bleeding, pain or feeling of pressure, we will do a physical examination. If the examination is normal, we may suspect endometrial causes or submucosal fibroids or polyps, and we will refer the patient for hysteroscopy. From the history, we will also be suspecting endometrial causes if there is persistent intermenstrual bleeding, irregular heavy bleeding, the patient is on tamoxifen, or if there is infrequent heavy bleeding and the patient is obese or has polycystic ovarian syndrome. And, like we have said, if we suspect an endometrial cause or submucosal fibroids or polyps, then we will refer the patient for hysteroscopy. If we do the examination and we find a palpable uterus or a pelvic mass, we may suspect fibroids and we will organise a pelvic ultrasound scan. And we do that too if the examination is inconclusive or difficult, for example, because of obesity. If the examination reveals a tender bulk uterus, we will suspect adenomyosis, in which case we will arrange a transvaginal ultrasound scan. We may suspect adenomyosis too from the history if there is significant dysmenorrhea, although we will bear in mind the diagnosis of endometriosis. In terms of management, if a patient has been referred for hysteroscopy, we will follow the secondary care recommendations. If a pelvic ultrasound scan shows large fibroids greater than 3 cm in diameter, we will refer the patient to secondary care and follow their advice too. Although, in the meantime, we may consider non-hormonal treatments such as tranexamic acid or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. If the pelvic ultrasound scan shows small fibroids less than 3 cm in diameter, or if a transvaginal ultrasound identifies adenomyosis, then the first line of treatment would be a levonorgestrel intrauterine system or marina coil. If this is declined or unsuitable, we can treat with alternative methods, such as hormonal treatments like the combined oral contraceptive pill or cyclical progestogens, or non hormonal treatments such as tranexamic acid or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Any patient that does not respond to treatment should be referred to secondary care. We have come to the end of this episode. Remember that this is not medical advice and it is only my summary and my interpretation of the guideline. You must always use your clinical judgment. Thank you for watching and goodbye.